welcome. Welcome to Scala.io. Did you guys enjoy yesterday's party? Yeah. Yes, right? It was awesome. Thank you, organizer, for organizing that and also for inviting me here. And this morning, I'm going to talk to you about my experience with functional programming. But first, a little bit about me, not the boring stuff, the interesting stuff. I'm Italian. And roughly 10, 11 years ago, I decided to flee my country and I moved to the UK, which, you know, these days, I don't know if it was the right call, but um, <laughs> we'll see. So my Italianness is going to influence my functional programming experience, and we will see how. Before doing Scala, I was indeed a Java developer, which I believe is the most common background for most of the Scala developers these days. No, I didn't know anything about ASCO. No, I didn't know anything about functional programming. And of course, I love Scala. I've been doing Scala for a while, and it's the language of my preference, of my heart. OK, so today I'm going to talk to you about the good, the bad, the ugly parts of functional programming. And this title directly links to this amazing movie. This movie was an Italian production when Italy was producing good films. And it is, was released 53 years ago. If you haven't seen it, it's amazing. Watch it. It's a little bit slow. It's a Western. So you, you will have, in particular, one scene that is five minutes long where nothing happens. And it's the best scene in the entire history of movies. So please do watch it. Uh, it's been released in December 1966. Director was Sergio Leone, and the music was from Ennio Morricone. The good guy, obviously, was Clint Eastwood, a really good-looking guy. And the entire movie is about these three characters. The good and the ugly, they always go together. They fight the bad guy. And you can see where this is going, right? Can you imagine how boring a movie with just the good would be? Right? And I think, you know, as a technologist, we should remember this pattern more. What I've noticed is that as technologists, we are really passionate about whatever we are doing. It could be a technology, it could be a tool, it could be a language, and we always talk about the good thing. But, unfortunately, life is not like that. Not just tech, not just languages, everything in life has these three components. Good parts, bad parts, ugly parts. Good parts are the parts that are going to make us fall in love with what we're doing. Bad parts are the mistakes, the traps that we have to avoid every time. And the ugly bits are the bits that, let's be honest, are not really ideal, but we kind of need to learn how to deal with them. So I'm going to try and apply this pattern to my functional programming experience. And hopefully, I will, if you're not doing functional programming, I'll convince you to have a look at it. And if you are already doing functional programming, my hope is to start a discussion, a constructive discussion, on how we can convince more people to switch to Scala, to adopt functional programming more. So let's start with the bit that made me feel in love with Clint Eastwood. Why am I in love with functional programming? Well, it simply makes me more productive. Let me show you what I mean with that. So, for example, in functional programming, you have this concept that is about immutability. So when I was doing Java, I would write something like this. If I want to do something exactly 10 times, I would put a nice var, a while loop with a condition, and then do whatever I have to do, and then increment my variable. Yeah? Makes sense? And in functional programming, what I do now is that I say, OK, from 0 until 10, for each iteration, do something. OK, but how does this make me more productive? This makes me more productive because in functional programming, I don't, need what, I don't need to know what do stuff here means. 
But in object-oriented programming, I do need to read that code and be careful that we don't do anything stupid. So chess, something like that. So in this silly example, what we replaced the task that we are doing, we are changing the variable, the value of the variable that we are looping with. So actually, now my function is no longer doing stuff 10 times, but it's doing it a lot less times. So it completely changed the behavior of my function. And in order to realize that, I need to read code. I'm lazy, I don't want to read code. I just want to know that it's impossible. It cannot happen. So you can imagine in a large code base, knowing that you don't need to read the code because you know it cannot happen, it's quite nice. It makes me more productive. I have to read and understand the less code. Make sense? Good? Everybody awake? Awesome. Next step, purity. Purity is the other thing that made me fell in love with functional programming. So when you have an impure API, you could have a function like this that is called foo, that takes a string and then returns unit. Can anybody tell me what this function does? Who knows, right? We have to look at the implementation. Again, I need to read more code. While actually, if you have a pure API, you know that just reading the signature of the function, meaning what it takes, what it returns, is enough to give you all the information you need to understand what the function actually is doing. That's it, it's all I need to know. Obviously, I can still look at the implementation to fully understand what it does, how it does it, but I know what it does, right? And if you try to put this in picture, what purity tells you is that the signature of the function is a full description of what a function does. No lies there. If you are working with an impure function, to fully understand what a function does, you will need to look at the implementation, which means reading a lot of code, which again, I'm lazy, I don't wanna do. And also there are a lot of other benefits that we are not gonna talk about, such as composability, that if the function is fully represented by a signature, then I can do cool stuff like composing things together. But one of my favorite things about purity is that it allows me to do what I call puzzle coding. I have a type, and I know that I wanna to go to another type, and somehow I know that I need to um, find function that takes me from type A to type B. This is really cool, for example, with IDEs. This is actually metals. We are gonna mention metals later again, but if you've never heard of it, go and check it out because it's gonna be awesome. It's gonna blow your mind. Um, but again, I don't need to fully understand what I'm doing. All I have to do is to connect the dots. And then the compiler is gonna tell me, boom, it works, awesome. It doesn't work all the times, but it works most of the times, which again is good because I'm lazy. I don't wanna spend too much time thinking about my code. So that's pretty good, isn't it? Amazing. Functional programming is perfect, right? No problems. Done. End of the talk. Of course not. So let's talk about the things that weren't actually really that nice in my functional programming experience. And these are the things that you can avoid. You need to be aware of and you can avoid. So the main pain point for me when learning functional programming was the learning curve. Functional programming is actually simple. We mentioned most of the principles, but you have immutable structure, you have pure function, total functions, right? And this concept can be expressed in potentially any language. More, language, more languages allows you to express it in an easier way, but you know, the concepts are simple. Don't use exceptions, don't lie around your types. Try to do the side effects at the edges of your program don't use mutable structures. 
So when I started learning functional programming, a lot of people confuse functional programming with categorical programming. Categorical programming is the programming behind category theory. It's actually a subset of functional programming. It's a little niche that I personally love, but it took me a while to master. It wasn't obvious to me, right? So I don't, I cannot stress this enough. I said this before, you don't need to know category theory to write good functional code. So when you start with category theory, if you go directly through the category theory path, it might be a little bit awkward. So I would suggest to stick with the basics, no bars, no muta not mutable structures, no exception, try to use pure function and you will be quite productive. None of my good things were about category theory. Um, isn't that repeated? Yes, it's repeated, so let's repeat it again. You don't need to know category theory <laughs> to write good functional code. And the experience that I had, the, the most stressing bit that I had when I was uh, talking to other people, going to meetups, and attending conferences was like, but models are easy. What are you talking about? It's obvious what they are, right? Everybody knows what a monad is, right? It's simple. It's just a monoid in the category and the functors. <laughs> What's wrong with that? It's obvious. Why, why you, Java developer, why are you saying that that is not clear? That is super clear. There you go. That's the definition. Done. Easy. Easy peasy, right? It's easy. And when I was objecting to this, saying, dude, I'm sorry, but this, this doesn't really help, then people start talking about burritos. <laughs> and I'm like, I'm sorry, but I'm even more confused now. I mean, so it's a burrito because it has layers? That doesn't make a lot of sense to me. So the other day on Twitter, Somebody suggested that a lasagna is a monad. So, that's a picture of two trays of lasagna that I did a while ago for a party of mine that is actually in my kitchen and my lasagna. And the objection was, hear me out on this. If you take a tray of lasagna, and you take the other tray of lasagna, and you put them together, you obtain a bigger lasagna that still has layers that you can see that are still you know, separate. Does that mean the love lasagna is a monad? <laughs> As an Italian, lasagna beats burrito every single time. <laughs> so yes, a lasagna is a monad. Some people always say that lasagna could be a semi-group. But that is really not helpful to a beginner. We are just confusing people. Can we just admit the category theory is not easy for somebody that doesn't come from our school or from a mathematical background? And that's why I cannot stress this enough. Talks and tutorials for beginners are essential are so important. If we want to grow the Scala community, yes, we need to talk about these things over and over again. One other thing that I've seen happening in my, in my time, people looking at a conference schedule and say, oh, not again, not another monad tutorial. We had tons of them. And my objection would be yes, and we are gonna keep having them. Because if we want to grow the Scala community, if we want to be a honest, welcoming community, we are going to need to keep explaining the core concept behind our coding style. Because they are easy for us, because we went through the pain of learning them. But they are not easy for people coming from Java, Python. So many people are coming from Python now. So don't underestimate the importance of talks and tutorials for beginners. 
If you're not into public speaking, that's a great way. Start with a beginner's talk. Explain what a future is. Explain what a monad is. Explain what an applicative is, a functor. We have so many fancy terms that really scare people off. And people will stop saying that Scala is a difficult language to learn. Another thing that didn't help in my career is what I call the rockstar developer syndrome. So the rockstar developer syndrome is we have a problem. Don't worry, I'll solve it. I'm going to go away, close myself in a room, come out with some crazy free profunctor optic solution, come out of it, done. It works, right? And then, as a senior developer, I'm not going to explain a thing to my team. So what is going to happen is that two things. I am going to stuck on that project forever because I am the only person that can maintain the code that I created. And the second thing is that eventually I'm going to quit because any bugs with that portion of code is going to be on me. I'm going to receive calls at 2 a.m. saying fix it. Can anybody do it? No. So we really don't need rockstar developers. We don't want to write a code that is not maintainable for our team. This is a big problem sometimes when you do functional programming. You have the knowledge, but you don't share it. As a senior developer, what you should do is to be a leader, not a rock star. Rock stars are not exactly useful in software development. What you should do is you should mentor, teach the other people in your team and make sure that everybody can maintain your code. You should empower your team to be more productive, do more advanced things, be able to survive even if you quit. So don't forget that functional programming can be tough to learn. And make sure, let's make sure to help each other rather than fight. And make sure to help people learn, share the knowledge that we have. And that was the bad stuff. So let's help each other, people. So let's move on to the ugly bits. The ugly bits are the bits that we really cannot avoid. They're not exactly a deal, but we can need to learn how to live with them. So for me, the ugly bits of functional programming is that every once in a while, you do have to break the rules. Let me show you what I mean. Let's suppose that we are writing a program that takes a case class and converts it into an array. Right? Simple. Maybe I'm writing something to a database. Maybe I am putting stuff into a, an Excel a spreadsheet. Whatever. So I'm a functional programmer now. I've done through the pain of learning functional programming. And this is what I would write. I will do what I was saying before, that is just puzzling programming. So I have a product. If you don't know what a product is, no worries. It's just a fancy word to say case class. Um, then I have a function, product iterator, that returns an iterator. And then I do to array. Boom. I have an array. Awesome. Right? Done. I can go home. What if I go back to my object-oriented programming world? Well, what I would do is that I would probably do something like that. I will get how many fields a case class has. That's a product arity. I would allocate an array of the size that I know I'm going to fill. And then I'm going to have a var that is going to loop over the size of my array, and it's going to populate it. And then at the end, I'm going to return it. Note that that example is exactly what I've mentioned in my good FP parts. I just told you a couple of minutes ago that having a var with a while loop is no, no, no. That's not good. Right? But what happens if we do some 
benchmarking. The reason why I'm putting the quotes there is because obviously benchmarking is something complex. So what I'm calling here benchmarking is writing a function where you start the clock, you run your function a lot of times, in this case a thousand times, then you stop the clock and you see what's the average execution of each function. So this is not serious benchmark because obviously this will run on my laptop yesterday after a couple of um, glasses of red wine. And you know, a lot of things were running off my laptop. I have done it multiple times. But um, if we rename the function implementation that we saw for functional programming to array FP, and if we um, rename the other one to array OOP, and we give it a big case class, right? A case class with 30 fields, because hey, otherwise it would be too easy, right? Um, what do you think would happen? Which one is faster? Who thinks that FP would be faster? Raise your hand. Okay. Who thinks that OP would be faster? Okay, most of you got it right. So, the average execution for functional programming, uh, I think I mistake the slides there. <laughs> okay. Let me, let me fix it, let me fix it. <laughs> Nobody saw anything, that's why. <laughs> okay, so the object-oriented programming one uh, is uh, roughly 10 times faster than the functional programming one, which is, as a functional programmer, for me was a surprise, right? What, what does it mean? Is everything a lie? <coughs> Well, no, it just means that Scala is still a JVM language. And sometimes the JVM language really doesn't go along with functional programming. Certain patterns are, let's be honest, not that great. And I'm not gonna go into details on why that's the case, but if you do some JVM profiling, you will exactly see what's going on. And as usual, it's array's fault. So, in this case, I had to know implementation details of how arrays work in Scala to avoid this pitfall. Another funny example, right? I um, tend to explain the concept of map through either an option or a list. And every single time I say, boom, this is the implementation of map for list. This is obvious, obviously my ideal implementation. And the implementation is as follows. You have a recursive, state recursive function where you basically traverse the list and you accumulate the results and every time you traverse the list, you uh, apply a certain function to the head of the list that you are visiting. This is beautiful. It is easy to read, nice, elegant, but this is just my ideal implementation as a functional programmer. Okay, be ready to be scared. If you're not ready, close your eyes. This is the actual implementation from Scala 2.13 of a map. It doesn't look like really functional to me. There is a bar, another bar, a while. It really doesn't look that functional. So does this mean that the Scala team is mean? They don't like functional program? No, it doesn't mean this. So, why did they implement it this way? Because this way was slightly faster. And making a standard collection slightly faster in Scala compiler means that everybody is gonna benefit from this slightly faster implementation. Let's be honest, this is ugly. 
is really, really ugly. And the Scala compiler is full of these examples. If you scroll this file, you will see a lot of ugly code. But the key here is that they don't show the ugliness to us. The API is nice, it's functional, it's pure. So what this teaches us is that if you have a really good reason, like you are developing the Scala compiler and you want to be as performant as possible, be ugly. Break your rules, put a var in a while loop, and you will be fine. As long as your ugliness is isolated and is not open to the public. Okay? And that concludes my ugly bits. So I would argue that Scala is the way it's designed is perfect as it is. It's good to have an hybrid language between functional programming and object-oriented programming because the JVM is not designed for functional programming, unfortunately. And every once in a while, usually when we have performance issues or memory allocation limits, we need to go back to our old friend. So again, Scala is perfect. Yeah, nobody clapping. Come on, guys. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. But the entire point of this talk is every time somebody tells you that something is perfect, eh, what are you hiding from me? Of course, Carl is not perfect. Of course, Carl is not perfect. <laughs> so, I can bet, I can ask you, each and every one of you, what you don't like about Scala, and everybody's gonna say something different. My personal things are that the compiler is low, and the tools, in particular if you do hard code functional programming, are really not that great. It turns out that the Scala Center is working really hard on all of this stuff. So these are just a couple of projects that the Scala Center is sponsoring to make all of this better. So regarding the Scala compiler, we have a work from Jason Zaug where he's working on uh, pipelining compilation is the idea of can we find a set of informations that are enough for me to start compiling the next module, even if the current module is not finished yet. And this has huge potentials of compilation speedups. Eugene Yokota is working on Zinc. Zinc is the incremental Scala compiler, right? So I can tell Zinc, look, I've just changed this little file. Do I have to recompile my entire code base or can I just cherry pick exactly what to compile. Then we have tooling. I don't know if you have ever noticed, but if you are doing <coughs> pure functional programming, IntelliJ, every once in a while, it shows you things that are little swiggly red things when they actually, they are absolutely valid Scala code. So we have uh, Bloop by Orge, which is, um, just a tool that allows IDs to communicate directly with the Scala compiler so that we know that, that if there is a wiggly red line under our code, there is a genuine issue, not just our ID lying to us. And then we have Metals uh, that is uh, developed by uh, Olaf, which is the ID that we saw in the GIF a couple of uh, slides ago. Um, that um, is just an alternative to IntelliJ that it should be a lot lighter and it, um, it will ensure you, uh, it will allow you to use your um, text editor of choice, right? So you pick the text editor, then you enable metals and then boom, productive as before. You don't have to stick with IntelliJ anymore. Um, 
So again, this is just a couple of things that the Scala Center is doing. I hope in a couple of months they will have achieved all of this, which means that I will have to find new things to complain about, um, which is great. This is how we evolve. This is how we make the language better. This is how we grow the community. So before I conclude, uh, what I want to say is let's be nice to each other. Um, if you, um, let's help new people come to this amazing language. So if you see new beginners asking questions, don't just assume that they, what, you don't know what a monad is? Because that's really, uh, that's really not cool. Um, and let's not be sure to teach people even things that we think are extremely easy. It's really important for us to make the language better and to have more people using our language. So that was all I wanted to talk to you about. Uh, all the slides will be on Twitter. And uh, I'm also writing a book with Manning uh, titled Get Programming with Scala. If you want, have a look at it. And thank you very much. I believe we have time for questions. Any questions? I promise I don't bite. Yes, we have a question over there. Uh, so, so thank you for the talk. Uh, it was a very nice talk. Uh, I have a remark. Uh, when you say OP, is mm -hmm. it imperative programming or object-oriented programming? Object-oriented programming. Because what this is um, immutable uh, oriented uh, object-oriented programming it is a thing, and it does exist in Scala, it does exist in JS, and everything else. But the, the example I've seen is more about mutability than object-oriented or class-based programming. Yes, uh, you are absolutely right. Um, my terminology might not be uh, spot on. What I wanted to say when I said object-oriented programming, I actually meant the style of code that I used to write before moving to Scala and before moving to functional programming. So yeah, you're absolutely right. Because uh, this is the thing. Uh, I might be nitpicking, uh, but I'm a big fan of uh, where Nodersky says that functional programming and object-oriented uh, Scala is a good uh, fusion of them. And yes, actually, absolutely. there's no, there's no um, uh, friction between the two, and I'm a big fan of this, and I think we don't need to oppose them, but we, we can oppose to mutation that is different. So yes. thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Thank you for the question. Anybody else? We have a question there. Thank you for your talk, Daniela. I have a question about your book. Do you follow the same pattern? Uh, do you talk about the good, the bad, and the ugly in the book? Unfortunately, I don't, also because I think my editor would have some copyright issues. Um, uh, no, no. I, I, I didn't mean the exact words, but uh, do you talk about like immutability and want to use it? Yes, absolutely. Uh, so the intent of my book, it's for beginners, so I don't go into any um, functional uh, programming, a topic that is too advanced, but I do teach you, hey, Immutability is good, mutability is bad because of this, try to avoid it, don't try to for exceptions. I do go through the, the purity of why purity is actually a really, really good, good choice. So I do cover the basics of functional programming. If you are interested in more advanced topics such as category theory, probably I would have other books to suggest. Um, and when we shall expect the book? Is it ready already? I, um, I am currently writing it. It's available in MIP, which uh, means that uh, you have a preview of what I'm writing while I write it. And hopefully it will be ready uh, first part of next year. But you know, uh, books are difficult to write. <laughs> yes, and I want to use this moment and invite you to be my guest at my podcast. Okay, awesome. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I have another question over there.
Hello, uh, thanks for the talk. Um, so my question would be, uh, how do you onboard newcomers onto functional programming? Typically people who come with a, a Java background. Yes, absolutely, that's a great question. I would start with the super basics, that is, don't throw exceptions, don't use units, um, and don't use bars or mutable structures. And then where, when they are more comfortable, I will start talking, hey, have you noticed the full comprehension? Have you ever noticed that it's just a flat map and a map? And you know, when you have a flat map, that is actually a monad. But let me tell you more about monads. And let's go behind you know, the, the mathematical backgrounds behind things. But I will start with simple, not scare them off. Let's just don't throw exception. Please, don't, don't, don't throw exceptions ever. Um, and then, when they are comfortable with that, I will start introducing um, mathematical con concepts by pointing out the bits that they already know without realizing them know that they already know what a monad is, at least in Scala, and Scala is simple. Okay, thanks. Another question over there. Thank you for all talk. I just follow up follow up question. Uh, how do you um, convince your managers to, to use Scala in the first place, uh, uh, knowing that we can use FP or some portions of FP using uh, in Java, like Vaver uh, library or some alternatives? I would personally start with the proof of concept, and I will tell my manager, look, this is what we currently have. If we were to use this tool of this language, this is what we would have. Which one do you want? And I will also be completely honest, again, about the good, the bad, and the ugly. I will show that it makes me more productive, but also say I will, of course, need to you know, mentor my teammates to understand exactly what's going on, because I don't want to be the one always on call at three in the morning. I have a life. And, you know, uh, I will be completely transparent and, you know, uh, if I really believe that this is the right call, they will, they will trust me. But I will not hide, I will not just talk about the good things, I would also talk about the downsides. Because also that demonstrates that you are serious about what you're talking about. It's not just you that want to use the, the cool tool that nowadays people use. And, Another good thing to, to do as well is to um, also do performance testing and see, look, I was using this tool and I can process this amount of requests. Now, if I use this tool, I can process this amount of requests. Uh, so I would use facts rather than anything else because unfortunately that's what managers usually look at. So. Another question in the front and one at the back. We'll come to you later, don't worry. <laughs> uh, thank you for your talk. Um, how do you work with other people in company uh, for maintaining um, quality standards with people who are um, ease with FP and people who are just coming from Java world as another question was said before? Okay, two words, pull requests. Try always to be nice, but try also to be honest. That goes back to all this talk, right? You can tell somebody, hey, this is really bad, without actually using any of those words. You could ask a question like, why did you use that tool? I would rather use this. Could you explain me your reasoning behind things? So I think PRs, pull requests, reviews are essential. And another thing that I used to, I, 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 I honestly love is knowledge shares. So if you just learn about free and how free can make your program more uh, easier to read, then do a knowledge share, right? Uh, you can have an half an hour meeting with your team. If you are in the same office, great. If you are on different time zone, you can do uh, a screen sharing and explaining why you are excited about it. And if they agree with it, then you can move it to the next step. There will be a proof of concept, and you know, uh, you take it from there. But I would 
mainly focus on PRs and knowledge shares to bring people on board. Okay, thank you. Back to first row. Sorry, it's a uh, hard work for you. Thanks for the talk. Uh, I have a question on the purity part of the mm -hmm. functional programming. And uh, I, I actually called functional code, and um, from my experience that purity is what you said, you, you read everything from the, uh, the, uh, the declaration of the function. Uh, that's something cool on the book or on the talk, but in the real world you have uh, your uh, project or your program with full of side effects. And you find that you want purity, you, you put them in the IOs, but if you put them in IOs, actually everything is wrapped in the IOs and you have to read the code, you can't see anything from the signature. And because you have a lot of that, uh, it ends up your full project is uh, IOs everywhere. And uh, my question is, do you have the same problem or how do you deal with that? Um, I don't have the same problem because believe it or not, I don't use IO. I don't use, uh, I, I mostly use futures. Everybody saw that and somebody's gonna punch you at the end of this talk. Um, um, the secret is, uh, there was a joke a while ago on ask of programs that do nothing because they're poor, right? You cannot have the entirety of your program that is pure. The key is that the core, the really important thing needs to be pure. And then of course you will have side effects, but they will be isolated at a DH of your program. So what I personally like to use a lot is to have a class that is clearly marked as, hey, this is full of side effects that contains most all the side effects that I'm gonna have to do. So you're absolutely right. You're never gonna be able to write a program that is 100% pure. But the key is to know the difference and to isolate them so that you can say, until here it's all pure, and then of course, I will have my side effects, but I am aware, I'm aware of where they are, and I can you know, uh, make sure that the side effects don't leak all over the place. I know it's, 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 uh, it's a good tool to make sure that the isolation stays, right? Because you separate declaration and execution. But you don't have to use that if you are not comfortable with it. Why? We go back to what kind of function programming you want to use, right? You can go really far, but just having simple rules and without going into monad's land. Thank you. Any more questions? One at the back. Uh, hi, th thank you for the talk. Um, you, you mentioned that uh, Scala was a pretty good language, but it had flows. So. Um, it has flows. It yeah, yeah. Uh, it has flows. Uh, that, that's what I meant. <laughs> um, so my, my, my question would be, what would you uh, recommend to someone who's never touched uh, functional programming or Scala for that matters? Uh, have you tried anything else? Any other language? Any other uh, thing that you would recommend to start learning functional programming? Or is Scala the optimal solution to learn? In my opinion, Scala is the best language to get things started with functional programming because it's an, uh, it's an hybrid, right? So you can decide, okay, this part of the code, I'm gonna write it in my old style, object-oriented programming, while this new part of the code, you know, I'm gonna play around with IO and see what happens, right? Uh, so it, uh, it gives you the possibility of exploring the space. I found that pure languages such as ASCII, at the time when I started learning functional programming were too much for me. So they required me to do a, a jump that was much bigger and I wasn't comfortable with it. So I would say Scala is a great language to start with functional programming. And that's Thank the you. reason why a lot of Scala developers then end up doing ASCII, by the way. <laughs> uh, but that's another story. Any more questions? Okay, awesome, thank you very much.